Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Of the 15 principles for effective witnessing. Say that with me. 15 principles for effective witnessing. That's what we're going to talk about in this segment. Uh, let me first begin with a few general comments before we go to this list. The original plan of God was not to create Christians, but to create citizens. God did not want a religion, he wanted a kingdom. And that is why the entire Bible is really a Bible about kingdom. The message of Jesus was a kingdom message. The original desire for man, according to God's word, was not to have servants, but sons. So now we got two words you need to write down. First, God wanted citizens, not Christians, and he wanted sons, not servants. The third word I want you to write down is the word relationships. God's goal for mankind was not religion, but relationships. God was not looking for people to sing to him. He got angels to do that. He wasn't looking for people to, to have services around him. He's got cherubims and ch seraphims to do that. God was looking for family. And let's get that in our hearts clear. When you study the Bible in its true basic essence, you've got a father with children. That's what the Bible is about. And the only unique thing about this family is that the father is a king. Therefore, the children are royalty. And his desire was for his children to rule just like he rules as a king. So his invitation to us is really a return to rulership. When you read the book of Genesis, the initial indication for your creation is found in 126 and it says let them have what dominion over the earth so we find a couple of things in the mind of God God really didn't want church religion with a lot of Christian servants what he wanted was a family of leaders who had a territory called earth to dominate or to rule that was his original and still is his plan now it is possible then to be a Christian but never become a citizen and this is the tragedy of the 20th century church I think the church in the first century understood this they understood citizenship it took them a while to get it but I think they finally did and even through the years during the development of the church under Catholicism and eventually coming into the Byzantine era when they began to see religion as a state function which was pretty close to the citizenship concept yet they went overboard and they began to force people into membership which created the Crusades which caused a lot of problems citizenship into God's kingdom was not to be done by the sword or by pressure but was to be done by willingness and submission to the kingdom rulership of God in the heart of a human so we cannot force people to become citizens of the kingdom of God. Let me just comment on something else for a conceptual point of view. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is what earth is about. Earth is about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is God's domain. The word king means one who sets the standards or the ruler. That's where we get our word ruler from. To, to, to draw a line means to set a standard. So the ruler of a kingdom is one who is the king who sets the standard in the kingdom. Dom is from the word dominion, which means your domain where you dominate. So a king dom is a ruler who has domination over a certain domain. So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, heaven is the invisible world where God 
who is ruler dominates that domain. But then his children, he wanted them to rule also. So he created a separate place for his kids, and he called that earth. And so we find these words in the book of Genesis. Let us make man in our own nature, image, and in our own likeness, disposition, and let them have what? Dominion or rulership or governorship or kingship over what? I didn't hear you. Right. So God is saying heaven is not your territory. Religion has made heaven our home. The Bible doesn't. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in the Bible does the Bible ever call heaven your home. That's found in a hymn book. That's found in some spicy teaching and preaching. But it's not in the Bible. Why? Because heaven is really not your home. The word home is the word for position or place of origin. In other words, the place where you were originally designed to be. You were not designed to be in heaven. Jesus is very clear about this. He said, when you pray, do not pray to go to heaven. Remember the prayer? His disciples asked him, teach us what to pray for. He said, pray this way. Our Father, say it loud, who art where? In heaven. So the Father is not here because this is not his domain. Then it says, holy is your name. In other words, we reverence him. He is our great Father and our God. Then it says what? Huh? Thy kingdom come, thy will or desires be done on earth. He says, pray that. Let what's happening in heaven happen on earth. The same way it's happening in heaven, let it happen on earth. He says, pray for earth to become like heaven, not for earth to go to heaven. I want to pause here. Because it's a paradigm shift in our religious teaching. We've been taught not to live on earth. Matter of fact, most of us can't wait to leave. We believe that our home, our destiny is in heaven. And Christ says our destiny is earth. Because our destination is God's original address for us. And God's address is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26. Let them have dominion over the earth. So even if we go to heaven, it's only a temporary stay. That is why the Bible ends on earth again. Genesis and Revelation 21 have the same story. Earth coming out of heaven. A new earth was made and a new heaven or atmosphere was put around the earth. And then we saw the kingdom of God coming down out of heaven. Jerusalem coming out of heaven. Christ coming out of heaven. And the saints coming with him out of heaven. And they reign with him on the earth forever. Why? That's your original address. But even more than the address, what I'm concerned about is the attitude. Because if you don't have the right attitude in the right address, you're going to mess up the new address with the old attitude. <laughs> What's the attitude you're supposed to have? Not servants and not religion, but citizens and sons. In other words, Jesus Christ, and here's a cautionary statement, is really your big brother. Your big brother died for you. That's why in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2 it becomes very confusing for Christians when Jesus says, I am not ashamed to call them my brethren. We call him Lord, Savior, Redeemers, you know, deep words. He says, no, we're family. And I happen to be your big brother. And you needed help, so I died for you. So you can be part of the family again. And I believe this is the greatest mystery of the kingdom of God. Now, here's the point then. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says... Our citizenship is in heaven. Please note, our citizenship is where? In heaven. Write that down, Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, in a few hours, I will be traveling to the United States. I will be taking with me my passport. My passport is proof that I am not an American. But I will be in America. 
And if you want to know where I'm from, you got to check my passport. Sometimes my language gives me away. Well, you can be in one territory and have citizenship in another territory. Paul says in Philippians 3.20, your citizenship is in heaven, but your location isn't. So when I travel with my passport, my passport tells everybody that I belong to another kingdom. I belong to another government. I belong to another state. Matter of fact, when you read your passport carefully, it never says property of the person who owns the passport. It always says property of the government. Why? Because you become a part of the state when you become a citizen. You become a personification of the government. When you speak, when you travel, you become the government in its essence. This is true of the kingdom of God. Jesus said that when we go into the world, we represent the kingdom of God. Our citizenship is not on earth. He knew where his was. He said many times when they threatened him, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Even though I am in the world, I am not of the world. But I am where? In it. So I am in it, but I am quite comfortable being in it because I know that my support is beyond the earth. My protection is beyond the earth. My preservation is bigger than the earth. And if you could capture that, you wouldn't worry about eating and drinking and having your bills paid this week anymore. See, if you believe that the only way to meet your needs is through your salary or someone giving you a break, then you got a problem, friends, because some folks don't like you. And your salary can never pay nor meet your standards of living. You'll always have some needs left over. But if you have an awareness that your citizenship is beyond this government on the earth and beyond your job and beyond your paycheck, then whatever they pay you is just enough for you to plant a seed which is what God intended for you to use your salary for. Your salary was for you to activate your other kingdom, not for you to live on in this one. And this is why citizenship is important to change your thinking. Do you know how wonderful it is for you to travel in a foreign country and to know that your government has equipment and military might that can quelch anyone that tries to touch you? There's a sense of confidence and pride and power and audacity that is not normal. How can Jesus Christ stand before Pilate, the governor in the nation of Rome, the man who could hold his hand up and you live and put his thumb down and you die? And Christ stood before that great governor. And the governor says, don't you know I got the power to take your life or to give it to you? And Christ answered without, you know, he was quiet all along and tell the guy threaten him. Don't threaten a guy from another state. Especially when he knows the power of his kingdom. Hello? Christ was quiet and tell the guy threaten his self. And he said unto Pilate, let me tell you something. <laughs> My kingdom is not of this world. Secondly, you are right. I am a king. You did say it well. But beyond that, I could call right now 10 legions of angels and they would wipe this palace out, he says. He threatened Pilate back. And guess what? Pilate understood kingdom talk, so he backed off. And he tried to release Christ from then on. Many of us don't understand the necessity of understanding what citizenship means. Now, why am I driving you in this direction? Because you see, salvation is about immigration. Write that down somewhere. This whole thing is about immigration. When we lost dominion over the earth through disobedience, we lost immigration status with the government of God. We became an alien. You ever heard that word in the Bible? Come on, say it with me. Alien. What's an alien? An alien is someone who is in a territory, but they ain't got no legal rights to be there. The Bible says we were aliens to the kingdom of God. Aliens to the, I like the word Paul uses, household of God. Which is a family statement. He says, even though you are a family member, you are living with a stepfather named Lucifer. <laughs> the fall of man is the kids believing they don't need their daddy, so they live, moved in with a stepfather. 
And Jesus said to us in the book of John chapter 5 and also in chapter 8, he says, you are just like your father, the devil. He's referring to what? Stepfathering. Why? Because God is the father of all creation. But you became a stepchild in the home of a stepfather. That's why you're under the step. That's where he wants you. And Christ says what? Christ came as what? The big brother in whose image you were made. And he came to what? He came to take you, well, let's put it this way. He came to take you from under the, the, the influence of the stepfather. What was his explanation to doing it? He says, no man can enter a strong man's house until he first binds the strong man. So he comes to earth to what? Bind the strong man so that the kids could come back home to the father. And it was Christ who told the story about the two sons and the father, one going off and destro destroying his life, and the father waiting him to come home. One of the things that really intrigued me with that story, and it still does, and recently has been much more mysterious to me, but what, what is mystifying to me is, one of the sons were out in the pig pen, the other son was home, but the father never went for the son. I believe the father ain't supposed to leave heaven. That big boy was supposed to go get his little brother. And that's what salvation is all about. It's about you going and finding your brother who is still out there, who is still a part of the family, but living below his privilege, eating pig food. And you got to tell him the good news that he can come back home. Dad's not mad at him. Matter of fact, dad already paid the passport papers bill. He can come back and be restored. And the good news is that the son who was lost came home. That is what we are about, friends. It's about immigration. It's about migration and immigration. My friends, salvation goes like this. When you are born again, you become a legal immigrant, but you don't migrate. <laughs> Got to pause there again. You actually become a citizen, but you don't leave the territory. You are still in the earth. And salvation is you and I being born again in the earth but God doesn't take us out of the earth bring us to heaven our citizenship is in heaven but we don't live in heaven we live on earth so we have immigration status but we don't migrate to heaven the Bible says you are in the world but not of the world you are an immigrant in the world but you don't migrate to where you're from and this is the the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ we are citizens of two worlds. We are, we are passports from two different countries. And by the way, one country supersedes the other. Hello? Someone asked me in the seminar this past week. They said, what do you do when your boss asks you to do something that can, conflicts with your conviction as a Christian, as a citizen of the kingdom of God? I said, well, there's no question. Either Either you lose your job or they submit to your convictions. In other words, there comes moments in your life when the two passports conflict. And you've got to make a decision between compromise or commitment to the kingdom of God. There should be no question about where your loyalty should be. It should first be with God. I like what Jesus said to the disciples when they asked him about, uh, about paying taxes. He said, you render to the Caesar? Only with a Caesar. Some things don't belong to Caesar. Like your heart. Like your values. Like your morals. They don't belong to Caesar. They belong to who? God. Who is the king and lord of your government. And so there comes a time when you got to say to Caesar, that part don't belong to you. I can't do that because that's, that, that, you don't have the right to ask for that. There are some things that are off limit to the kingdom of this world and we've got to know the difference and that is when we become an irritation and sometimes even a change agent to the world now Jesus said in Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 he says repent for 17 rather he says repent for the kingdom of heaven has arrived he had just started his ministry and he had just opened up his work this is the first time he had a public declaration his message was a strange message. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has returned to earth. So his invitation was to a kingdom 
or to a government, to a country, and it was repent, which means to change your mind. Change the way you think because the kingdom is now available for citizenship again. You can be restored back to your original status with God. This is the mandate of the church. Then he says to us, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, to every kingdom, to every creature, the good news that they can come back to the kingdom of God. Now, one of the things we've been dealing with in this conference, or should I say in this series, is how do you bring people back to God? Can I talk to you for a minute? Look at me. You want to chat with you something personal. I tried to emphasize this last time. Sinners are not your enemies. They are your brother and sister who is out of the family. This is such an important statement that I'm beginning to see how valuable this is for us to change our attitude. Every Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, Confucius, Scientologist, Rasta, these are family. Christ loved, and you're supposed to love them also. These are not enemies of God. Christ died for who? Not the church people, but the world. For God so loved, not the church people, but the people who are not in the called out select ones yet. Ecclesia church. And one of the most important things we have to understand then is that Christ didn't come to save the righteous. But to bring who? Sinners to what? A change of mind. So we need to see the world differently. We need to stop looking at these people as being uh, enemies of God that are trying to take over Christian territory. We need to see them as people who don't understand the full value of their lives and who they really are and how important they are to God and what the good news is that they need to know. What's the good news? Well, according to the most of the church, they ain't got too much good news. When we tell those people about God, it's not good news. We tell them how evil they are, how, 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 how they're on the way to damnation and destruction and hell and how horrible it is. If they don't become like you, then they're going to hell and burn forever. And so we give them this, this bad news. How come Christ never told a sinner about hell? I was studying this in the four gospels two weeks ago. You know, I was just analyzing. I said, let me see if Christ ever preached hell to a sinner. I can't find it. He told the religious people about hell. The ones who thought they wasn't going there. Are you with me? He told the Pharisees, he says, he says, if I didn't come to you and expose your unrighteousness, you would still, he says, you are still in your sins and you will die in a lake that will not be quenched. He told that to religious leaders. But the sinners, what did he do? He told them, I find no fault. I do not condemn you. It's amazing his attitude was opposite to ours. Why? Because they are family members. He wants them to come back home. The good news is God has paid the price for everyone to come back to be a citizen of the kingdom of God again. What we need to do then is to find out how do we win our brothers and sisters back to God. God doesn't have, God doesn't have this sadistic attitude that I'm going to save 10% of the earth and the rest of them can go to hell. If you think God thinks like that, then I believe that you are thinking the way I thought God thought before I came to God. I thought God was that way. I thought God was a big monster with a big fly swatter in heaven, just looking for someone to kill. That was my attitude to, to, of God. I, I, I thought God was just a monster looking for people to hurt. But when you read the Bible, God died for people to be saved. And guess who he died for? People who weren't interested in him. While you were yet sinners, it says. Christ died for you. He died while you were what? Yet sinners. You didn't even want him. And he died for you. Is that love or what? Let's give him a hand for his love. He loves us. He loves us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for loving me before I believed I deserved it. This is the good news. The good news is God loves every child and every human being and he loves them to the point of death. And this is why we need to change our attitude toward those who don't know Christ. 
The wisdom of Jesus in making disciples is a perfect, perfect example and model for us for how to do it. And I gave you the first six. Let me give them to you. How did Christ get to win people who didn't know him? First of all, number one, don't criticize. We begin by criticism. You're drinking. Don't drink. Stop smoking. Stop cussing. That dress too short. Stop wearing makeup. I mean, we attack people before we convert people. Christ did not criticize any sinners. Christ did not criticize any sinners. That's incredible. So when you go to approach people this week, don't look at what's wrong with them. Tell them what could become right in their lives. Tell them the good news of what Christ already did to make their lives better. Tell them about who they are, that they are citizens of a kingdom with power and glory and honor that's been crowned upon their heads and they're missing it. Tell them what they're really looking for. They're really looking for their father. Number two, make friends before converts. If you're going to win people, don't go out to try win people as, you know, scoring. People say, how many you got today? That's not the attitude for winning people. Matter of fact, your responsibility is to love the world. Hello, somebody. The Bible says they will know that I was sent by the Father by the way you love, not by the way you preach. So our job is to what? Make friends before converts. We need to approach people to become friends. Why? If you want someone to listen to you, they got to first like you. If you offend people, they don't listen to you. Am I right about that? Yeah, and we are easy to offend, especially us religious people, because we believe in many ways we are already straight. If you only know how much crooked stuff in your life, you would be very quiet. If you think about how much you still got going on in your life that needs to be fixed, you would be sympathetic to a sinner. Hello? See, I like Jesus' attitude again. Here come the Pharisees and scribes. Caught a woman in adultery. By the way, where was the guy? Who knows? And he bought the woman. And they were all ready to what? Criticize and convert. Convert by killing. They picked up stones. They're ready to carry out the law. Everybody say the law. You know, there are folks in this world who are Christians who are more concerned about the law than about love. You don't worship in a certain way, don't worship on a certain day, or don't eat certain things. They attack you with law. But my friends, this thing is about love, not about law. And they said, the law says we must stone her if she's caught in adultery. Christ said, let me just do something. He bent down and began to write. No one knows what he wrote. Nobody knows. So we got a lot of, uh, you know, suggestions what he wrote. Someone says he wrote a list of sins. Someone said he wrote the name of the guy who was there. <laughs> And, and, and it probably was one of the Pharisees. Oh, oh, God. But we don't know what he wrote. But what's the beauty of this is, he did not condemn the woman. And guess what? She became his friend. And he said what? Go and sin no more. Folks will like you if you don't offend them. If you're going to win people, be like Jesus. Make friends before converts. Number three, be interested in what they are interested in. Don't just attack people concerning what you want them to do. You want them to become a Christian. Maybe they don't want to become a Christian. So find out what their interest is. Everybody is only interested in themselves. I'm going to repeat this because you don't believe it yourself. Everybody is interested in themselves. Tell your neighbor, he's talking to you. Now, I know you're sitting there going, no, man, I love everybody. Praise the Lord. I just love the world. Hallelujah. You know, I, I don't, oh, me, I'm nobody. I just, oh, stop lying. Everything you do is motivated by your own interest. Even loving me has an ulterior motive. Let me tell you how deep it is. Let me get real spiritual. That's why you got saved, because you're selfish. You got saved because you don't, you don't want to go to hell. You, you, you. Not that you don't want to go to hell. That's why you got saved. Clap your hands. It's true. Self-interest. Now, sometimes you talk to people and they say, I don't care about hell. See, because hell is no, it, it's not a priority in their life at the moment. So if you start talking about hell, they laugh at you. 
see in your life you scared of hell so you got saved for what fire insurance not because you love Jesus matter of fact the disciples didn't follow Christ because they loved him first they followed him because he fed them what was their concern business these were businessmen they were fishermen that was their business and business wasn't good so he met their business needs and they say we will follow you brother hello somebody and he, they were with him for a few days. He says, why do you follow me? He said, because I caught fish for you, right? Yes. And later on, three years later, he says, if you love me, you'll do what I say now. Not if you are ministered to by me. Everything you do is self-motivated by your own interest. And so when you talk to people, listen, the easiest way to get people to be your friend is to talk about their interests. Remember that. Tomorrow is a great time to test it out. When you go to work for the first time, shut your mouth and listen. Go to your colleague and say, tell me, what are, what are some of the things you want to do in your future in your life? And then just shut up. They'll talk to you. Because their future not include heaven. They're not interested in that right now. They got problems. What are their interests? What are their dreams? What are they interested in? Number four, become genuinely interested in the other person and talk in terms of their interests. Don't be able to become interested in what they're interested in. Talk about it. Let them talk about it. I was on the airplane coming in yesterday from New York, direct flight, sitting next to a guy who was in charge of a, a, a development plant in North Carolina. Didn't know the guy, obviously, stranger. But I tell you what, I start to apply these things I I'm teaching you. Number one, I wasn't after a convert. I wanted to make a friend. Number two, I didn't want to criticize. I wanted to compliment. And number three, I wanted to know his interest. And I just started asking him what his name. I gave him my name, where he's from, and everything else. And, and I said, what do you do? That's all I had to say. What do you do? He started talking. This is what I do. I said, tell me about that. And he started telling me about it. I never said I was a man of God, Christian, saved, born again, pastor, nothing. He talked for 35 minutes nonstop. Then he says, I'm talking too much, hey. I said, no, I'm really interested in what you do. And I was learning things I never knew. Listening to him, he became my teacher. And when you listen to people, you make them feel important. And guess what's the basic human need? The need to feel important. Listen to people. Number four, become genuine. Number five, give your best first impression. Smile. I mentioned this last time. You're going to win people. Please be, you know, nice with your face. You don't want to follow someone who's ugly and depressed all the time, looking like they're mad at the world, been baptized in lemon juice three times. I mean, some of the people who call themselves full of joy in the Lord, you don't want to go near them. By the way, some folks having such a hard time in life, they just need a smile. Nothing can disarm a person faster than a smile. Sometimes a person may even know on the job you're a Christian. So when they see you walking, they're already ready. <laughs> what do you do? You walk up to them and say, good morning, and just a big smile. How are you doing today? It's great to see you. And then walk off and say nothing. Because the smile is enough. The Bible says, that a cheerful countenance make a light spirit. That's in the Bible. A cheerful countenance, a smile, makes a light spirit. It lightens the person's spirit. If people be, uh, are lightened by your presence, they want to be around it all the time. You always depress people. people say, oh, here we go again. He's coming to preach now. Lord have mercy. And they're gone. Why? You are nothing but a, an irritation to them. You're not a joy. Tell your neighbor, smile with me. So I can like your presence. And some of y'all look so much better when you smile. You see your face from my point of view. Come on, camera, get some of these smiles. Come on, show your teeth. We show the world how good the people look here in the Bahamas. See that smile? Look at that. By the way, where, where, where? Your teeth, it's okay. It takes 73 muscles to frown and 38 to smile. Go ahead and rest your face a minute. So much easier to smile. By the way, smiles are never for those who wear them. Why? You can't see them. They're not for you. God gave you a smile for other people. Go ahead and give it away for a moment. Just turn to somebody. Just give that thing away that don't belong to you anyhow. The 
Bible says, a merry heart do it what? Good like a medicine. A man without a smile should not open a shop, a Chinese says. You want someone to come and buy your religion? Then smile. You tell folks, I mean, imagine people say, you tell people, boy, if you follow God, you'll be happy like me. It doesn't work. Number six, remember and call their names. If you're going to witness to people and share your life with people, remember that a person's name is the sweetest sound they ever hear in their language. Jesus was a tremendous name remember and caller. Matter of fact, he always called people's names. God loves people's names because people's names are important to them. That's why God called Abraham by his name. Abraham, Moses, Moses. Joseph, Joseph, he called them by their names. Why? Whoa, that sounds good to me. You ever been in a crowd with a lot of people and someone called your name but it wasn't talking to you? What did you do? I mean, here you are smiling. Yes? Yes? And they wasn't talking to you. But that sound woke you up. All of a sudden you felt important. Remember in school when they were calling names on the roll? All the other names you don't remember, just waiting for yours. Why? Because your name is the most important sound you hear in your language. When you talk to people, remember their name. Matter of fact, you want to really get blessed. When you meet somebody for the first time, don't try to convert them. Just try to remember their names for next time. And then call them up and say, hey, uh, Jeffrey. And just the name Jeffrey, they say, you remember me? Yeah, man, you, 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 you're my man. Let's call a check how you're doing. And he goes, that guy remembers my name. Man, he's really interested in me. I'm not just a blob of humans. Remember people's names. Number six. Number seven, you're listening. All right, number seven, write this down. Listen, listen, listen. That's number seven. If you're going to win people, shut up and listen. Be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. Remember, everybody has a story. Oh, I want to emphasize that so much. Everybody has a story. And by the way, friend, your goal is not to make converts. Your goal is to open people up to friendship. <laughs> this, is a, this is amazing. Everybody has a story. Everyone in this room right now got a life that could be a book. The point I'm making is there's something to listen to in everybody's life. These teenagers got stories, secret stories you don't know about. Some of them dealing with struggles and problems and boyfriend and girlfriend and sexual temptations and all kind of secret stuff. And they got stories they're dealing with. And we don't listen to them. The older folks sitting around you, you wouldn't like to know some of the folks' stories sitting behind you. They will blow your mind. Sometimes you walk into people and you go, do you know Jesus? 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 If you knew what I was going through, we won't talk just about Jesus, baby. Am I right about it? Some folks are going through hell. They got a story. They got a story. So you got to listen. That leads me to, to number eight. If you're going to witness the people effectively, ask questions. Become a student of that person. When you ask questions, you become a student of the person you're asking questions to. Help the other person expose their own heart. Bible says, out of the heart, what? Out of the mouth, what? The heart speaks. So if you want to know what a person has in their heart, you got to listen to them. To listen to them, you got to shut your mouth. The best way to get a person to talk is to what? Ask questions. You know, this, this is supposed to be fun. I want you to go to work and take this list with you and just check it out. Look at the desk, okay? And then go around and just try it. You'll be amazed. All of a sudden, the folks who couldn't stand you began to write like you. My goodness, she's finally listening to me. And he's finally interested in what I'm doing. Ask questions. No one asks questions more than Jesus, did he? Let me tell you why questions are important. Because you don't know what the person wants. Christ would see a person blind, and he, you would assume the person wants sight. He never did. He would say, what do you want me to do for you? He saw a person deaf, he wouldn't go and heal him. He would say, what would you like me to do for you? You tell me what's on your mind. He never presumed someone needed his help. That's important. He made them 
asks for it. He asks questions. And this is why it's important for you to follow his method. We need to win people by getting them to speak and talk about their life. And you do that by what? Asking questions. And sometimes, you know, uh, at the end of this series, I'm going to give you a list of questions to ask people. I'm going to give you a handout. Because you need to know some of the questions to remember. You know, questions, simple questions to make people talk about their life. When a person shares their life with you, they begin to become a soul partner with you. And the deeper they share, the deeper they become a soul partner with you. When a person becomes a soul partner, they begin to share their desires and then their needs with you. And now you can reach them on the level of their spirit. See? But if you just keep talking about what they, what, what you think they need, then they, they see you as being presumptuous. How do you know I need salvation? I'm doing fine. You, you're the one who ain't got no money. Am I right? So if you come to Jesus, he'll solve all your problems. Girl, I've been working with you for five years. You got more problems than anybody else. So you just assume that they need what you got. No. Let them talk and ask them questions. Number nine. If you're going to be effective, make the other person feel important. And you do it sincerely. How do you do it? Talk to people about themselves. Not about yourself. Make them feel important. The best way to make a person feel important is to get them to talk about themselves and then you talk about themselves with them. And guess what? That's the basic human need. The need to feel important. When a person feels important because you make them feel important, they're going to want to be around you. Why? Because that's what they need. They need to feel important. Are you getting it? If you want someone to like you and to be open to what you have to say, make them feel important. How do you do it? By not talking about you. Shall I be saved for 45 years, sanctified through the Holy Ghost, the Lord being good to me. You know, I was in the problems the other day and the Lord delivered me. Shut up. Just let them talk about themselves. Christ, the famous one. Lady, uh, can I have some water, please? Question, right? That's a question. Can I have some water, please? And she said, you have no bucket to get any. He says, I know that, obviously. That's why I'm asking you for water. She says, well, you're a Jew. We're not supposed to, to communicate with each other. And plus, I'm a woman. He says, that's all right. He says, you're right. He said, but you know, uh, uh, the Jew and the Gentile are both going to worship God eventually this, in a different way. And then he says, uh, where's your husband? Listen to the questions, man. He's getting what? Deeper than water now. Where's your husband? She says, I have no husband. He says, you're right. The husband you got now ain't the one you, ain't yours. She says, I perceive. <laughs> You know more than you're telling me, huh? And then she said, who are you really? And he began to ask questions, pulling stuff out of her. And guess what? She feels important now. First of all, a rabbi speaks to a woman. It'd be more important than that. Number two, a man speaks to a woman in public. That's illegal. Now she's feeling really important. Thirdly, he wants to ask her for something. Man, rabbis don't ask for nothing. They give stuff. He's asking for her to give him. Listen, friends, you ever go to someone who's smoking and ask them to borrow their match? You'll blow their minds as a Christian. Can I borrow your match, please? How do you know I got a match? You smoke, man. Let me get a match. Let me go fix this thing. You smoking, don't bother, don't bother me. You know, you smoke cancer. Cancer, that's your problem. That's fine. I, I was tempted by that myself. And then go do your work. Borrow their match. Ask them for something. Have you ever asked a sinner to... To loan you something? Matter of fact, they pay you back faster. <laughs> Come on, talk to me. This woman was a sinful woman, and God asked her for water. Who do you think you are? A child I only do business with believers. Mm -mm. Dangerous stuff. Hey. Clap your hands right there. That's a good place to clap. Yeah. You don't want to do business with too much believers. Sometimes the worst people to owe money to are saints. Say, that's true, child. Yes, sir. When a believer comes to borrow money from me, I never give it. I never, I, I never loan a believer. I give them money. Here. Don't you really bring it back. That's, that's it. That's a gift. Don't let's get into that. Come on, clap. That's a good place. It's a lesson. Learn that. Don't loan a believer nothing. You want to protect the relationship. So don't loan them nothing. Don't loan them nothing. Give it to them. Tell them God bless you. That's a seed. <laughs> so when you're in church the next day, you don't got to look over your shoulder and check to worship. 
Hey, that's yours. Don't look at me. Worship God. That, I don't want nothing from you. Can I hear an amen, somebody? Make the person feel important. And you do that by talking to them about themselves. Number 10. And we're going to end here in this one. Avoid arguments. Write that down. If you're going to witness, you avoid arguments. Jesus never argued with a sinner. Never. He argued with these religious people. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It's always the Christian people who want to argue with you. Child, I don't believe you worship on this day. I mean, you shouldn't eat that. You shouldn't wear that. I mean, they want to fight. I don't believe in this tongues. I don't believe. See, always these Christian people. The sinner man don't care about tongues, short skirt, or anything. That's why I like to be with them. They, they're easier to be with. Hello? They cuss, they cuss. They ain't pretending not to cuss. I curse. Okay, Pastor Miles. <laughs> Am I right about this? Some of these saints, you go around and go, Woo! Did you just say that? More difficult to be with these saints. I mean, these saints. Christ... Christ was very, very kind to sinners. He avoided arguments. Let me tell you what. To win people to your way of thinking, you should understand the futility of an argument. It doesn't win people. Let me put it this way. When you win an argument, you lose a friend. Write that down. Whenever you win an argument, you lose a friend. Because you make the other person lose face. You make them feel small. You need to understand that this is not about argument. It's about love. And some people are waiting. When you walk in with your I love Jesus pin, they are ready for you. They don't got their whole list of scriptures out of context ready to work on you. So don't get involved in that. You want to win people because they are open, not because they are angry at you. When you win an argument, you make the other person feel inferior. And you can't open up a person's heart if they feel inferior to you. They actually hate you. I like this one. Write this down. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Say it with me. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You win an argument and the guy feels bad because he lost the argument. He still believes what he believes. By the way, I got a little hit here before we go. Uh, how do you win an argument without argument? Here's how you do it. Number one, you avoid an argument by a simple method I've learned that's been working in my life for 31 years. Here's how you win it. Write this down. Okay. Sounds deep, doesn't it? You can win any argument with two letters. What are they? Okay. So when someone comes and says, I don't believe that Jesus is God. Okay. And just look at it. Think how powerful those two words are. I don't believe in this Christianity thing. Okay. I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay. And just don't move. Just stay right there and look at him. Okay. Can't you feel the problem? They're waiting for you to say something else. Okay. I'm finished. Now, why do you say okay? Okay means what? You agree with their misconception. Why? Listen to our master at work. He says, agree with the adversary quickly. Someone comes in opposition to you, he says, just agree with him. Why? You can't win an argument and win someone. So just agree with him. Okay. I like Jesus, you know, before his trials. I mean, he was awesome. He, uh, Herod says, are you a king? He says, you say so. He just, quiet. Works and miracles. This generation, I tell you. It's amazing. He was quiet. Pilate asked him, are you a king? You said so. In other words, I agree with you, whatever you say. You say I'm a king? Fine. How do you fight someone who ain't fighting? Come here, Carlos. Let me show you something. I want you to press against my hand as hard as you can. Okay? That's what an argument is. He's tension, I'm tension. He ain't giving it, I ain't giving it. 
Here's what Jesus says. Press against my hand. Try it again. So you want to fight me, hey? See? In other words, ain't nothing happening. Thank you. That's how you win an argument. Everybody say, okay. Ain't that fun? So someone comes to you and say, boy, I can't wait to see Caleb. Boy, I tell him. Yeah, they're talking about all this tongue stuff. Yeah. Now, I don't believe in tongues. And they're waiting for you. And what do you say? Okay. So you win an argument. Agree with your adversary. Isn't that the rest of the words? Quickly, while he is in the way with you. In other words, while the relationship is good, stay in the relationship while it's good. It's frightening, isn't it? Oh, but you see, we feel like we got to prove to them how deep we are, how much we know, how, you know, we are get revelation. And we, we got to teach them that, you know, that the, the, the spirits of God, the seven spirits of God around the throne is, is the intricacy of the awesomeness of the, oh, shut up and just say, okay. Say, how do you know the resurrection is real? I really don't. Well then, wh why do you believe stuff? Because it works. But I don't believe in it. Okay. And you know what they do normally? It, it, it hardly ever fails. Later they come back to you and they say, you know, I really, I, 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 I'm not really a pagan, you know. I mean, and they, <laughs> see, the way is open. I didn't really mean that, you know. I was just, you know, everybody was there. I want to make sure they didn't make me feel like I didn't know what I was doing. And you're right. I don't know what I'm saying, so help me. <laughs> okay. The best way to win an argument is to avoid it. Write it down. Paul says in Timothy, avoid foolish arguments. Don't get involved in it. A brother offended is harder to win than a city with walls. If we're going to win the world, we've got to learn the methods and the wisdom of Jesus in winning the world. I've got 15 more to give you. I'll give you 15 total. So we got about uh, eight more. We're going to deal with them in the next session. Got five more? Okay, five more. And they get better as they go. Is this helpful to you? Give the Lord a hand for wisdom, learning how to win people to Jesus. Amen. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.